Uh, yes, the topic for today is long-term tracker maintenance. And we have split this um, into two uh, halves, you can say. Um, in the first half, we are going to talk about um, general maintenance um, and um, how to keep the system from, uh, from deteriorating over time. Um, and the other half, we will talk about one very important part of um, maintaining a system uh, in most settings, and that is change management. Um, in essence, the change management is about um, updating, uh, adding new functionality, fixing bugs, and this kind of thing. Um, I'm Marcus Becken uh, from the University of Oslo. I'm leading the Tracker Dev team there. Uh, and um, uh, with me today, I have Prosper um, uh, Behembis from HISP Uganda. Um, I tried to add Prosper to the public agenda. I see uh, on uh, the screen earlier here that I failed, but uh, Prosper is surely coming uh, uh, and um, is going to support me in this session today. Uh, so we have uh, seen this house many times this week. And um, this is uh, this house is uh, sort of the uh, anal analogy for different um, aspects of a tracker implementation. Um, and if um, if we uh, imagine the house looking like this when you are uh, first uh, releasing your uh, you have finished piloting and you release it, uh, this is your house um, all freshly painted and looking nice. Uh, this session is about how to keep the house nice and avoid um, avoid the house um, rusting, decaying, and abandoned, uh, as we can see here. And um, I wanted to start off this morning with um, a little bit of uh, feedback from you. Um, from uh, the early birds that uh, already has joined us. Um, and I want to ask you a question. And I, I want you to type a response back to me. Um, it will help us guide uh, the topics a little bit to which uh, parts of the system you are interested in or which, which uh, topics are, are um, are uh, important to you. Um, and the question I want to ask, and now you have to listen very carefully, is what types of challenges do you think will arise over time? Or what types of challenges do you know will arise over time in the tracker implementation? So what is the what is the problem that does not show up the first week, but maybe after a month or after a year? Um, and uh, uh, what what types of problems do you think about when I ask that question? And I'm going to share a different screen now for a second. Um, let's see. I'm going to try at least. Marcus, I don't want my tracker program to look like that rundown house. No. That's <laughs> how not to do that. Let's try to manage that. The, but the first thing I have to manage is to there. Okay, stop share. There, I found the button. And now you should be able to see um, a Mente screen. You all see the question, right? What challenges do you think no will arise over time in the tracker implementation? So. Um, uh, uh, this is not your first Menti in the week, uh, so you probably know the drill. <laughs> Go to www.menti.com and add the code 18194939. And then you will be able to ans answer this question.
it might be what cha what uh, challenges worries you over time. And as you send them in, they should show up here as a word cloud. Please, uh, please go ahead and and uh, and type in some uh, some answers. First ones are in. Thanks. I brought the quadruple espresso to this session, so if I'm started starting to talk very fast, please let me know in the chat. Um, yeah, by the way, a practical thing um, in the um, in the sessions, please type in your questions uh, as they occur to you. Um, I will try to monitor those questions coming in as we go in the session here. Um, it's um, uh, I also plan to take a break. Um, twice in the, um, in, during, the, during the session and, and answer a few questions live. Um, and the ones we don't get to live, we will get to later. So please just post them as they occur to you in the questions channel. So I'm seeing performance scale. I think this has been uh, very much highlighted and worked on with the COVID context. I think that's been an interesting um, upgrade with COVID. So I think that's great. Performance is, uh, seems to be one of the main, uh, main uh, uh, challenges. And we will get li a little bit into that. And performance and scale comes a little bit together. Because um, when you scale up, there is some part of the system that might become less performant over time. So we will both get a little bit into how to uh, design uh, so that we avoid it as much as we can, and also a little bit about how to manage performance of the system over time. And I see people have been listening. There's uh, considerations on privacy and security. We've talked about that. Yes, uh, and, uh, and someone also wrote um, uh, user turnover and, and uh, and capacity building. This is uh, this is related, um, and I, I I like to see this uh, brought up. Yeah, I think this is that's a highlight of this um, this session it is the fact that we have technology, but that's only one part of the problem and the issue. The other part is really the implementation. How you um, work together as a team? How do you keep it functioning? So. Hmm. I see, I see metadata, I see new uh, requirements. Um, which is uh, also about updating and maintaining the program over time, there will be changes to the metadata, there will be new requirements coming in. Yeah, Pomod highlighted that yesterday in one of his presentations. He said the only constant in this COVID situation is that there are no constants. It's always changing. Mm. Yep. Seems the cloud is stabilizing. Uh, it means uh, probably that uh, most people have entered their their um, uh, concerns and um, data storage space. Yeah, that's an interesting one. We, um, we will try to get a little bit into data storage space. One thing that I can remember and <laughs> mention right out of the bat is that one of the, um, in addition to the normal uh, like payload data, if you, when you enter more and more patients, there will be more and more data, of course. In addition, we have the, um, the audit logs, which is something to uh, keep an eye on for the data storage space. Um, and and uh, audits should be managed. Uh, you should keep the audits you need, but um, uh, but uh, it might also be a good idea to clean up audits or um, turn them off for programs that don't need them. 
system monitoring, I see here, that's good. Uh, it looks like we will get into many and most of this, um, this, uh, uh, this concerns. And, um, uh, and I think we are ready to move on. Um, I, um, I think that um, it seems like the following slides will hit uh, pretty well um, what you were asking for. And, and um, I will also try to emphasize the, the things we have seen here. And scale and performance uh, and sustainability uh, is, um, is the winners. Um, when it comes to sustainability, um, I have not focused so much in this um, in this um, uh, presentation on the um, uh, on the um, sort of funding and um, uh, and uh, stakeholder buy-in and and this part of sustainability. I have focused more on the technical uh, sustainability for the system. Uh, so just to prepare you a little bit for for that. Uh, and um, so some of the things that I see in this cloud is also um, touched on later sessions this week. So make sure you come to the later sessions, for example, for um, for interoperability issues, for um, also for a bit on scale and performance. Uh, this is being touched on on the hosting uh, later this week. Uh, when it comes to the um, security and um, and uh, privacy, we uh, also have the access. Um, management uh, session on Monday. Uh, so I also see uh, topics here that we will cover later. So we'll keep this uh, cloud with us as we, we go into the, um, the sessions later in the uh, next week as, as well. All right, I will stop sharing here. Thanks all for your comp contributions. Um, and we'll go back to the, um, the, um, the house. And we'll talk about how to avoid the the problems that we just uh, that we just saw uh, in um, in the cloud there. Um, so some common challenges, and um, uh, this is um, uh, mostly cross cutting the ones we had in the work cloud already. Uh, the software might be out of date, um, and by this we mean that. Um, when you install it, it's new and everything is up to date. But uh, as time passes, the operating system, Tomcat, Postgres, Java, will uh, become old. And the, there will be fixes um, on security. There will be uh, improvements in performance um, in this software. And it's important to have some routine for updating it. Um, the other part is the DHS2 and, and the Android app uh, itself. Uh, the um, uh, the day you install it, it's the best version that we have. But over time, uh, we are doing maintenance and development of the software, and and it will be necessary to update after a while. Um, one of the other uh, sorts of problems you get is uh, I call it accumulated garbage, and it could be mentioned in many ways. Um, it was. Um, it was maybe referred to by, by you, some of you as uh, metadata um, or updates, uh, new functional demands. Uh, what will happen over time is that uh, you will get, um, sometimes you will get user accounts that uh, you no longer need, especially super users. Super user access to help debug is uh, especially um, especially touchy subject. We'll get a little bit into how to uh, get over and clean up this. Uh, and the other part is unused data elements and indicators, uh, which, uh, which might uh, make it harder to maintain your system. Um, we have problems with turnover. And, and that might be that some parts of your system is very well known to some of your, um, some of your uh, staff. Um, there might be um, uh, knowledge about how the system is set up and working. That's only in the head of some of your staff. And if, if you have turnover, this is uh, information that uh, is often lost or at least partially lost. Um, another problem with turnover is new people coming in. They 
they might have new conventions and they might do, to, do things differently than the people that um, were there before them. Uh, and uh, one last big group of, um, of challenges that might uh, come over time comes from accumulated data. Um, and some of the scale and performance we talked about here is can also be kind of referred to as accumulated data. On the day one, your system will have no data and, and you will start entering uh, records. And uh, over time, there might be both logs or um, uh, and also um, data that uh, is being used day to day that gets accumulated. And uh, this might affect your system in different ways. So um, to pick up the first uh, the first point of the software out of date, um, I'm um, uh, I'm mentioning operating system Tomcat, Postgres, and Java first here because the, this is uh, maybe the ones easiest to forget. Um, and and um, to be able to have an upgrade plan for this, they, they are invisible. <laughs> Uh, unless there is a problem, you never think of this. And, and um, you as a manager need to make sure that, uh, that you have a routine for checking or thinking about this from time to time. Um, there might also be parts of this that has automatic updates like your operating system. But um, um, th there should be a routine to go and look at the versions of everything and have a plan for upgrading from time to time. Um, on the DHIS2 software and Android app, um, we, um, we know that, um, that uh, main releases are, um, are uh, released uh, uh, every uh, six months, approximately. Um, and these main releases are uh, bundles of new functionality and fixes, and um, and they are a bigger operation if you want to upgrade the main release. But um, I want to put uh, special emphasis on the point releases every six weeks. I often see systems when we go into help or when we when we are supporting someone, we very often see systems that is that is um, uh, on older versions, uh, point release versions. So if you're running 2.35 uh, and um, you, you um, uh, were running 2.35.3 um, in the beginning of the week, because 2.35.3 was the newest version we had, um, it should be something to think about when we released 2.35.4, which we did uh, two days ago. Um, as you see here on the side, um, the uh, the uh, 2.35.4 was released on the 25th of May. Uh, you can read about uh, the fixes and updates that was in 2.35.5.4. Um, and you should really consider upgrading um, on these uh, point releases. Maybe not every point release, but you should you should think about um, uh, you should have a clear plan for how often you upgrade upgrade. Uh, on your main version, there will be a six week cycle for point releases, approximately. Uh, which means that the next one is coming out uh, in one and a half month, approximately. Um, so uh, on, on the upgrading of this uh, infrastructure, um, uh, Prosper will come back more to testing later. Uh, I just wanted to briefly mention that when you upgrade the infrastructure, there's like you should do a small regression test for sure um, to make sure that your system is still uh, responding. Uh, and uh, th that um, uh, upgrading of a, of a point var point version for uh, from 235.3 uh, to 235.4 uh, requires, I would say, a medium regression test. Uh, these point versions are uh, no new features, but uh, there might be fixes, there might even be database uh, schema updates in a point version, and, um, and you should uh, do a regression test when you do an up upgrade of the point version. Um, when it comes to the full 
uh, up upgrade of a new main version, then that's a different game. Um, you would need a full regression test. You would need a rollback plan. You would need an Android upgrade potentially. Um, in the future, we will also have individual app upgrades um, that might be necessary when we start delivering apps um, when in um, their own um, release cycles. As you know, uh, new versions of the DHS core apps is being delivered on the same six monthly release cycle as the uh, as the DHS2 main WAR file. Uh, but in the future, this will not be so. The apps will um, be um, uh, compatible with several main versions and um, upgrading an app will be a separate decision from upgrading the DHS2 backend WAR file. Uh, so, um, so this will be something to think about uh, in, in the future. Um, to get a little bit into the problem of accumulated garbage, um, and, um, and um, uh, some of the things that we might call accumulated garbage, one of them is user accounts. Um, we should uh, we should try to make sure we have um, uh, we have uh, oops, um, a role of routines. So uh, uh, role on routines also, but in, in addition uh, to to avoid garbage, you need role of routines. Uh, so when someone quits their job, it's very important to clean up their access. Um, and uh, uh, this should always happen, uh, but then uh, routinely you should also check whether this role of routines is actually working and I would be very surprised if there is not some users that gets forgotten or somehow not rolled off properly. Um, and there are some tools in the system that you should make sure someone looks at from time to time uh, to make sure that, um, that we um, uh, look at people who hasn't logged in for a long time. A line, for example, here hasn't been in the system for a long time. Of course, these are not um, uh, the people that do not log into your system might not be the the, the ones that is most important to, to get rid of. Um, but you have some tools and some help in the user management app. This is not something you can trust, though, because if you have a really malicious user that will log in and misuse their access, they will log in and you won't, won't see them on this list. Um, and um, uh, these users you would need to properly roll off from the beginning. Uh, giving some local man management here might also be a good idea and give the local authorities or the uh, authorities closer to the users responsibilities in, in making sure that in their district they know everyone who has a user access. Um, and the other big point here, and this is something I see very, very often, and um, uh, I'm sorry if someone in the, if I'm pointing the finger at someone in the room right now, um, but if we are asked to help from, from Oslo, uh, we very often get the super user account. And in my case, what I'm usually doing is I'm logging into the system and I'm gonna help uh, supporting um, supporting uh, or debugging something, debugging a program rule or whatever it might be. I almost never need super user access. What I would need if I was gonna log in is access to some test facility, hopefully in a test server if that's possible and never super user access, almost never. Uh, so don't give out the super user access. And if you do, please re delete it again. And in your own organization, there should be a very limited number of people with super user. It's almost always possible to give a more targeted role access to the users. If you give super user, that guy can do everything. It can, he can look at all the data, he can tamper with everything. Um, this should only be your most trusted um, uh, employees. Um, and the... Um, the um, super user uh, uh, access is uh, is uh, is something to think about from the very top. Um, 
the, the, the number of super users should be monitored and you should know which super users are in the system. Uh, that also uh, brings another topic. I'm not really getting into it now. We'll get more into it later in a different session. But uh, if you give someone access to your system, they should sign an NDA with you. And we will try to do that from the University of Oslo. We'll try to have a, a ready one that we will give to you. If you ask me to log into your system, I will send you this document. It will have my signature on it. I will have it, have it on, the, on my desktop. I'll send it to you and you need to sign it and send it back or else I won't log in. Um, that's a bit of a tangent. So I'm uh, continuing to the next part of accumulated garbage we might see in the system. And this is unused data elements and indicators. Uh, so uh, just trying the Sierra Leone database and searching for name, you will find several first names and several last names. And, um, and uh, it's very hard to know which one is actually being used in different places of the system. Um, and as you add more programs, as you add more, um, more data, um, and as you make changes, uh, this problem will become bigger and bigger. And uh, it has to be managed. This is very hard to manage, though. It has to be managed in many different ways. And one of the ways is that you should routinely um, do a walkthrough of this um, of your metadata and make sure to get rid of the trash. For uh, data elements, for program indicators, for indicators, it's super confusing. If you try to build a dashboard and search for indicators and you find many indicators with very similar names. Um, so metadata cleaning is the recommended action. And this is uh, this is maybe, I would say, something that I wouldn't aim for doing more than twice, uh, once a year. Um, um, yeah. Um, uh, also, if you have, uh, if you're getting into changes, um, there might be need for data migration to avoid um, unused data values in your system. Um, okay. So another known challenge that we have to manage is turnover. And, and um, just to illustrate one of the problems with turnover, um, the design, the, your program, and uh, how it works um, might be one of the things you might lose when you lose one of your staff. And um, I, I put design ideas here. Um, and uh, and um, in my example, I'm showing off the um, gestational age field in one of the trackers um, I was once uh, involved in. Um, and uh, if, if this, uh, if the description of how this works is in someone's head, it will be super hard to just search for gestational age and start looking at the program rules for how this field is calculated. We can see that the gestational age is clearly wrong. Um, it's uh, super high. Um, and uh, unless you have a proper design uh, documented, for example, like this, explaining how this calculation is done, uh, it uh, might be nearly impossible for someone to fix the problem or update um, this, um, this calculation. Uh, so our recommendation here is to make sure your, dis your system is designed and you keep the design document and keep it updated. Um, on a more general uh, term, uh, the system knowledge, the knowledge about how the system works, about which scheduled jobs are running, um, what problems you once had, uh, is also something that um, all too often is in people's heads. And um, I put some points here. Uh, in your in implementations, you have to make sure you get um, you get the uh, culture for for noting down and making documents uh, documenting how uh, how your system works with the scheduled jobs. Um, when you make a hard earned learning, if you if you have a problem and solve it somehow with a workaround, uh, document it and and keep it somewhere safe. Uh, and document server. Uh, uh, operating procedures um, so that um, if there is something that you know you have to do from time to time, please uh, make sure 
that is um, that is written down in in case that guy that usually does it uh, leaves. Um, another problem with turnover is, uh, as mentioned in the beginning, convention changes. And convention changes might be look very in innocent. It might be um, the when we looked at the data element uh, earlier, we saw that um, first name was written with a capitalization in one case, and it was not written with a capitalization in another. That's not a big problem, but it's um, it's it's not a good culture for the people working on your maintenance team to uh, not be very strict with these conventions. Um, it, when it comes to user group, the problem is uh, no longer just an annoyance. It's uh, it might be a real problem. Um, and in the Sierra Leone database, we see this real problem. Um, we see the, the, um, some of the user groups being made especially for giving access to some data sets. Um, then we have some others that might look like um, uh, family planning program coordinators, for example, what is that? Uh, and um, administrators, Africare HQ. Um, we, we should have a very uniform way of making these names and, um, and making sure that um, it is apparent to anyone what this group is as apparent as it can be from the group name. And the only way to do this is to make sure we write down our conventions and, uh, and uh, that uh, people rolling off, uh, rolling on will will not bring their own ideas they will um, th they will look at the existing conventions and bring their own ideas on top by changing the convention and and um, doing it as a mindful task um, then uh, one of the very big points that um, that was um, coming from your cloud as well. And I can see a question or two coming in on that as well. Um, the accumulated data. Uh, and it's natural that your tracker system will become bigger and bigger over time. And unless you have specific cleaning routines, you have to expect that um, your tracker instance will forever grow. Um, and one of the things that will make it grow forever is the uh, audit um, uh, audit history. If you turn on the um, uh, if you turn on the um, the audit history uh, for uh, even for reading access, uh, then you will be very well protected in case there is a problem and in case you have to go back and look at uh, look at what um, actually happened back in time. If there is a loss of data, for example, you will have a very good uh, overview of what happened. But uh, a data read audit is also very um, uh, cons uh, space consuming. So depending on what parts of the audit you actually turn on, uh, then uh, you might need to have routines for cleaning out this audit table. Um, uh, OK. And then. Um, and then um, another challenge that uh, we have seen uh, very practically over time somewhere, and I think maybe Pamod touched on it yesterday. Um, we, uh, as we get more tracker data into the system, um, it's very possible to build indicators that will become heavier and heavier and heavier over time. We have seen this in many countries. We have seen this um, uh, in Ghana, for example, where our indicators for calculation of um, of um, people attending care uh, was um, looking at more and more and more data as more and more data gets accumulated in the HIV system. Um, and uh, this is not something that is always avoidable, uh, but it's always something you can manage. And um, one, one way of, um, of managing it is to make sure you don't have a super user that logs in uh, and does a calculation on your entire country um, country um, uh, implementation. So uh, if, your, if your super users has access to the same dashboards as the clinic or district users, that might be a, a red flag to look into. 
a cumulative, cumulative value is usually also heavier than other types of indicators uh, because the number of uh, data items it needs to look at for tracker is going to be bigger and bigger and bigger as time passes. Um, another part where we have a very known uh, challenge is this, um, this working lists. Um, if you're uh, using the standard working lists in Tracker, if you have not put any thought into, uh, into this, uh, these lists, then uh, the Tracker is delivered with, with this uh, front page list that we see here. And uh, for those who know no Tracker, uh, we are now looking at um, a list of all the active enrollments in, in my program. And this might be, depending on your workflow, this might be a list that is forever growing. And after the first week, it's no longer a list that's actually useful to anyone. Uh, it might be a, a good idea to turn off this list uh, and um, ask everyone that looks for data to search for the record they want to see. Or you should make a custom list. You, you should think about and design what is useful for the user. Maybe you only want to see the, um, the records that has a, a scheduled enrollment today. Maybe you only want to see uh, the records with some, some filter placed on it that will uh, make sure you have a working list that is meant for the user to find very quickly the record he's working on. If you don't have such a list, it might be best to turn off this list, the working list here. Um, we also have non -known, unknown challenges uh, that um, by their, their nature is unknown. Um, and um, although I'm telling you about two known challenges here, um, there is no way of uh, making sure that your setup does not have a bottleneck somewhere that will um, get worse and worse over time as more data come in. So the last point here on the accumulated data and the, and the re real management um, that you can do over time is to make sure you have a well-developed uh, um, developed monitoring mechanism. And this monitoring mechanism right here, I'm taking a screenshot of Glowroot that's running on many servers um, and uh, uh, can be useful in, in monitoring response times and, uh, and um, seeing problems before the user sees them. There is, other, uh, there is also a guide in the, in the documentation on how to set up um, uh, Grafana. And uh, th there is many different ways of monitoring your server. And, and uh, the most important thing from your perspective is that um, you should make sure uh, that you have a team that set up a monitoring that will show you the problems before the user sees them. If you hear, if you hear about the problems from the user, it's usually too late or it might be so bad that, um, that um, it puts very much pressure on the team trying to support um, both on the country and, and uh, when we get involved from the central level, um, it's too often too late to, to, um, uh, to, to start supporting or the system might already be down. And that puts a lot of pressure on the people working on this we would much rather try to find the problems earlier um, on, on the uh, systems. Uh, on, on the central level, we're also getting better at, um, at uh, testing and performance testing. But uh, on your server, you need to monitor it to make sure that you know it's doing fine. DHS2 can be configured in a million ways, and uh, it's not possible for us to test all of them. You have to make sure you monitor your server. So just a quick um, recap of the uh, things we have been through here, and then we'll do a short break for some questions. Um, the um, software out of date uh, uh, question uh, should be managed with software update routines. Um, and this is something you have to initiate as a manager. If you don't, it won't happen because this is, uh, much of it is, um, is um, a problem accumulated over time. It's not really a functional need that drives you to upgrade. It's the, um, it's the, um, uh, it's your job as a manager to make sure this is planned for and considered from time to time. Uh, for the accumulated garbage, um, we will get into how to avoid the accumulated garbage in the next part of the session. But 
the cleaning routines is super, super important um, uh, because uh, it's not possible to avoid everything. Um, we will, uh, you will need to have a roll off uh, and the activation um, routines and uh, routinely cleaning the, the metadata and database. Uh, to manage turnover, you need the signs, you need to have things documented, you need service operating procedures. And um, when it comes to the accumulated data, there is some design decisions you can make sure to, uh, to do to minimize the problem. Um, but uh, in your maintenance process, you need to make sure you have a monitoring step, you have a monitoring routine um, to, to look at your service health and, and to raise an alarm on an early stage if there is, um, if there is uh, problems uh, coming. coming. Okay, so um, the next part of the session is the maintenance and change management process. Um, and uh, before that, uh, there has been some questions in the chat. Um, uh, one of them was, um, uh, what version are you working on for a tracker? And uh, I see that some people are gonna, uh, Abdul is gonna start on version 35. Uh, and uh, I would say start with 35 or 36. Um, 36 was uh, recently released, um, but uh, the testing for 36 was better than any previous version. So uh, I wouldn't be uh, very hesitant at starting at 36 either. 35 is fairly new and, and a good version. Uh, one thing to mention on the, the versions of DHS2 um, is that um, uh, one of the most important things at the moment is to uh, start at either the newest version of 34, the newest version of 35, or the newest version of 36. That would be my main recommendation. And the reason is that all these three versions has recently been upgraded to become, um, uh, in some cases, an order of magnitude faster. Uh, the, the earlier point versions uh, within 34, 35, and 36, well, 34 and 35, I mean, the earlier port ver point versions like 34.3 um, was uh, much slower, and we have fixed many bottlenecks the last year, working with many of the implementations around the world. So stay at the latest point version, that's the most important uh, comment I can give. Uh, there was a, a question on the, on the audit history, and we will, uh, on the hosting session, we'll talk a little bit about the audit uh, config. Uh, so come back there. Um, as a manager, the most important decision is how much audit do you need to turn on? Or do you want to turn something off? Um, the, the question that was raised in the channel was whether you are able to identify which user has entered tracker data, not only modified, but entered it in the first uh, instance. And the uh, is, uh, easy answer, Mohaber, is that that is stored in the database. We don't have a, we, it's not showing in an elegant way in the user interface, it's stored in the database. So you can get it from there, uh, but it's not showing. Um, this is something being considered for the new capture app that we're working on to have the, also the first user uh, visible somewhere so that you can see which user entered it, the data in the first place. That was kind of missed in the last uh, app there. Um, Abdul uh, is asking about saying that one of the main challenges uh, was to update the form and uh, moving data elements, for example, from one stage to another. And we will get more into the uh, this sort of uh, problem in the next part of the session. So I might uh, save this for later. Uh, and um, Nirmal Dakal is asking about the largest known tracker implementation to date um, in terms of tracked entities, visits, and so forth. Um, and uh, I think that Sri Lanka is uh, one of the bigger, uh, the one that we mentioned yesterday with 17 million TEI. Um, I think in some ways the Bangladesh instance is bigger, but I don't have the numbers right here. Maybe I can get help from some of my colleagues to dig up these numbers and re reply Nirmal in the chat. All right, thanks. So with that, um, I will go into the next uh, part here. And um, this is the development process versus the maintenance process. And um, 
you know that development is something that uh, well um, that, that that happens at the beginning, right? You you start by designing your system, you make all your data elements, you have a sheet for uh, for your indicators, you build your dashboards, you make everything ready, you test it, and you release it. And the first time you do these three steps, what you do is usually work without anyone well you might be under time pressure but there um, you would uh, have your development uh, guys working on this um, and after testing and after you're happy with it you will release it and the way you release it is that you open it for the public for the first time and then after you have started your instance for the first time then the process of maintenance starts and uh, i'm going to talk about development in the maintenance process during the maintenance, you have to maybe make a change, like um, like uh, Nirmal is asking. You, uh, after the users have started using the system, you will need to add the field. You will need to add a new program or change something, as Nirmal was saying, as moving one data element from one stage to another. Uh, this is also something you need to develop, test, and release. And then um, maybe just after you finish developing the first thing and when you started testing it, there is something else that you need to start to develop, test and release. And uh, this part of the process is what I would call the change management and maintenance process. Um, and this can be new functionality, like we mentioned, uh, new stages, new indicators. It can be bug fixes. Maybe your COVID uh, surveillance guidelines changed. Um, the change is the only constant uh, um, Pamo told us yesterday, and that is so true for COVID. Um, it has been uh, a nightmare uh, supporting somewhere, uh, some places, because the uh, surveillance guidelines changed as we learned about the virus. Um, yeah. Um, when you do these kind of changes, this is a point for later, but you have to think about retraining. Like, are we need, do we need, actually need to retrain now after, the, after these changes? And for COVID, this has been very, uh, very, very relevant. Uh, maybe there's training materials we need to upgrade. Maybe there is data migration. Uh, in the case of Nirmal, that was uh, one of the problems. You need to move some data from one stage to another. You can't just move the data element. You have to move the data as well. Oh. This is, uh, this is uh, something you've all been waiting for, the, the word of the day. So make a note of this. Android tracker is the word of the day. You all got it. Uh, and with that, I will um, hand the word to Prosper to talk a little bit about testing. Uh, as you note down your word of the day, Prosper will unmute. Hello, Prosper. Hi, Marcus. I'm there. Yeah, uh, thanks, Marcus, and um, uh, thanks for that opening, um, you know, quiz around what challenges would would face and uh, clearly our training, how we can go about some of this. And um, at this particular session um, uh, really looks at testing um, both your configurations uh, and testing your, your final product before you do the release. Yeah, so um, it both serves as also for the purpose of documentation, the way we've seen it. Uh, if you have a well-documented test plan, it, it should be able to um, inform your documentation on some of the changes that happen, some of the new features, uh, and it also serves uh, in, in purposes where, in, in, in implementations where you know, you are sharing the configurations, you are multiple, multiple users sharing the configurations. So you all tend to have to come to a common document that you can all refer to. So for configurations testing, we're really looking from the point of um, the metadata itself, what data elements you're going to have, what uh, attributes you're going to be having, what type are they, and, and to the point where we look at, you know, the program itself, once it's been created, uh, testing the different stages and um, the behavior in, in those stages. But most importantly, also looking at the program rules, which are very key for our implementations and the, prog and the program indicators. So um, we, we've used this particular um, case, use case in our in our support to the Minister of Health and Wellness in Botswana. 
uh, to build a, a tracker program for nutrition, uh, tracking children from birth all the way to 18 years. And, and so uh, this document has served uh, for very many purposes. One, to help us document what we are capturing and when it's being captured. Second, to be able to use this document for training, uh, because when we talk about sustainability, as Marcus was, was, was sharing, um, you need to have a document that people can keep referring to for how the pro your program is documented. So you will find this uh, kind of document uh, very key uh, for even training the, the users um, or who you are trying to get uh, familiar with your program implementation. So um, it's a pretty, you can add in more columns, you can add in more, in more, more information that you need to capture, but pretty what will be more important is to have a, you know, a documentation of all your, of the, of the implementation. And, and for this, we're looking to see that you can be able to do, to document your attributes, your, your, your stages and, um, and, 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 and the program rules and indicators in that. So we do see that if you could come up with a document that clearly specify the data element or attribute, what type it is, any special um, attribution to that particular attribute or data element in terms of what we call others, you can see like, for example, for age, we are auto calculating it or the filling and, and so somebody who will come in the future to look at your documentation and, and your program will know that the age is auto, auto, auto calculated. Uh, we look at the logical considerations. These are the skip logics that you, most of you will have in your tools or the logic patterns uh, for your for program flow. You need to document them properly. And, um, and, and so somebody who is using this document and testing your configurations is able to know what exactly you're trying, trying to achieve. Uh, we also uh, could look at uh, uh, program rule documentation. Uh, and this is basically spelling out what a, a, diff, a given program rule at a particular attribute or other element is supposed to do. And a little bit put that logic and uh, also have a variable, a program variable, because you know, program rules uh, use variables, program variables. So you can also specify these program variables again to help you document your work. Uh, you, you are, your implementation. Uh, so that if I'm looking for a, a given program rules and I'm going to change it, I can look at this reference document and be able to, uh, to go to that program rule and I see how it's configured. But most importantly, this document will be used by your team to test the configuration. So we have a status here. Uh, some of you can even add a column that can you know, uh, exactly describe what the what the test uh, outcome has been. And then a status here was whether the team has come back and is able to, to review and, and clear that uh, issue. So for, for this particular, we're using comments. It's a Google Doc sheet that we're using comments, but you can have another column that can specify a person who tested um, what they were able to do. So, uh, and you can have color codings that we have down there uh, to to quickly in, um, communicate what is happening on each of these of, of these tests, so some of them you'll see that we have discussed it and it's uh, it's put in the system and training testing. Some could be that you have yeah the team you have discussed and haven't been added in the system. Some you may need more clarification from the program implementers. These are the non tech people who will tell you how the, the the program rule should behave or what how data they need to be collected. And, and uh, during the testing, of course, you also find some areas where you need to delete some of the things and you can highlight them red. So this is a living document that can be used over time and um, both documents, your testing and your configuration. Uh, example down here is having a team in the Ministry of Health and Wellness in, in Botswana trying to do some testing and give feedback on this, on this kind of document. And it has been used for training as I shared. Next. Yeah, so um, again, we have looked at testing your configuration, uh, but there is an, a, another point, you know, towards this uh, release of this implementation, you need also to come up with a test uh, plan. Uh, and particularly this will uh, look at testing the completed uh, program or, or program track, uh, prog tracker program or event. Uh, and at this point, you, you, your, 
probably moving from the developers or the, the implementers, the DHIS2 implementers, to the end users. And um, it's always good to use people who, are, who probably don't have um, a lot of knowledge about the, you know, the program rules and all that. And, and so in your test, in your end user test manual or test plan, you need to clearly explain the functionality of what uh, what what's supposed to be tested, and then uh, give them expectations. And once uh, the expectations are not met, then you allow them to be able to document that. So uh, this is one of the manuals that we developed for again testing uh, a tracker program for school learning in education in S13, the Kingdom of S13. Uh, and you see clearly you have to state the objectives of what is being tested, the requirements for the testing. Uh, if you go over the test number six, uh, you have to describe what they should test, uh, what is required, and then the steps they have to take to be able to uh, test that particular functionality. And again, you can give them the expected results that, so that if they don't get the results, then they are able to document that, you know, we are not able to arrive at this, uh, we are not able to arrive at these results. And, and so that helps you again to refine your configurations or to look at, you know, whether it's user settings, users, you know, roles and all that. And so down in the corner here, you have a test results and, re and resolution where you allow the users to be able to, for each test to go over it and then um, document the issue that they have uh, faced. And then um, they could do, do recommend what can be done, uh, but also as you as, a, as an implementer, you can also do your recommendations and then you have the action. And this again helps you to be able to monitor what has been resolved and whether you are meeting all the requirements. So this test plan can always be uh, uh, drawn from the requirements for the system. So if you have the requirements and you have this requirement then it has to be tested and then you see the output and if it's not met then you can be able to go back and see how to resolve it. So you can also have these documents, these are what documents on Google Docs to share so that you can be able to all be able to work together. Since in most of the implementation, we found ourselves working as a team. So you need a centralized uh, testing plan and you know the config for both the end user and also for configurations. Uh, next and the last. So again, um, the tracker implementations, uh, we, we, we tend to really also look at the, the implementation itself in terms of the devices to be used. And, and so it's very important, uh, even before the release or deployment, to test uh, the gadgets that you are going to use. Uh, in most cases, particularly like for COVID, where we have used the tracker so much, uh, we've tried to rely on the on the tablets as a mode of data capture, uh, some as uh, laptops and uh, you know desktops. Um, it, it's one thing that uh, partners will come and start dumping um, tablets to you, which cannot be able to meet the requirements. So uh, we do advise that you can you also take time to test the different devices, um, and this ranges from the you know the tablets, the phones, uh, in terms of size, in terms of capacity, in terms of uh, what accessories you can have on those on, on, on those devices. Uh, particularly for Botswana, as you can see in the corner, we had an opportunity to test the different phones from right, the five or two or four inch screen phones to the, to the tablet 710 to the the Chromebook, as you can see, the gentleman there trying to test out Chromebook um, uh, data entry in a, in a clinic. And uh, for the tablets and phones, we tried to put like, you know, keyboards to see if that works very well and tested it with, with the different health workers. And for this particular one, it's really important that you use the, the end users and take it to the environment of the clinic. Don't just test from your you are in a town office and think it's going to work, it would be good to go out in the field where you have no connectivity, where you have no space and, uh, and uh, with so many people, uh, so many clients you are serving and also test its performance. So uh, take time to, to do tests of the different devices so that you can be able to recommend the appropriate devices to, to use in your implementation. 
So again, this uh, summarizes what we, we wanted to share with you around the testing that will help you in terms of documentation, in terms of managing different um, um, implementers who are supporting the, the configuration, managing the updates both in the, in, the, in the implementation, in the program, and also the, 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 the DHIS tool development itself, and also cleaning up your metadata because you will see that if you have documented all your metadata, you will see a lot of redundancy that you can be able to clean uh, with time. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I think I'll turn it back to Marcus. Thanks a lot, Prosper. Uh, there was a question in the um, <clears throat> chat while you were uh, presenting uh, whether there would be test plans available for the generic packages. And uh, we will get back to that, uh, Nirmal. Uh, but maybe um, we can ask whether the documents that you just shared is, um, uh, is uh, whether it's possible to make them available for um, as a sort of a reference on how to do it. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, so these documents are just pretty uh, open out. Yeah, I will, I will pass them on to the, to the team to be able to share with the, with the, with the participants. Yeah, the two documents, which is the configuration testing and also the end user testing. Then we might put them on the. I'm, I'm sure there's a place we could we could put them together with presentation or something that uh, would make it available for the uh, for the um, audience um, at a later stage. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Prosper. Um, so after the the change has been developed and uh, and um, and uh, tested, uh, then you need to release it and. Um, Something to some things to think about uh, with extra emphasis when you are doing releases on an already existing, already running system is that the user training is so easy to forget, um, and um, the the users know how to use the or the system. And when you change it, they uh, this change might be so small you don't need to uh, retrain. Um, you might just need to update the reference material a little bit. Um, but for bigger changes, you definitely need to have a new training. You need to think about the, uh, the, the retraining. And this needs to be done before you even uh, start to think about releasing this to the users. If it suddenly shows up in the, in the user interface and the people don't know how to interact with it, you will get um, confused users and bad data in. Um, and then also communication upfront is, is something that is so easy to forget when we sit and forget and, and uh, develop. And uh, these are kind of horizon questions that you need to think about as a manager. This is your job to think ahead and think about everything that the developers aren't thinking about when they're developing the change for you. Um, the users need to know about the uh, deployments, uh, especially if there is downtime, uh, if the system is getting taken down. Uh, but also because the system will change at some point and they will need to know about the changes up front. Uh, and then um, when, when all the surround surrounding things are okay, you can start to think about the detailed deployment plan. Um, and then um, to talk about the deployment plan, um, I put it inside the maintenance um, uh, arrow again to signify that this is a release that's happening on an already running system where there is already data collected, where there is um, there is um, uh, users that uh, are using the system to do their job, um, and um, the, uh, there is one additional plan you need to make. Not only the the release day uh, deployment plan, you need to make a rollback plan. And the rollback plan will help you in case something goes wrong during the deployment. And this is, uh, I put extra emphasis on this because it's so easy to forget. And this is also something that um, that uh, all the solution-oriented uh, technical people on your team will probably not think about until it's too late. And this is your job as a manager to make sure that the rollback plan is there uh, and it's being developed together with the release plan. This is your job. If you call yourself, uh, well, if you are the manager of this, um, then this is your job. I'll give a, a free, um, uh, a free basic release deployment plan here. Um, the the very basic plan can be 
close the production environment for all end users, block the IPs, make sure no one gets into the system, then back up the database, and then follow any detailed steps. This can, for example, be updating metadata. This can be updating the DHS code, WAR file. It can be database data migration. For example, if uh, you're moving one uh, data element from one program stage to another, you probably also need to move all the data. So you need to run a script at this time to move the data. Uh, then um, verify changes. Then this is the next step. And, and this is crucially uh, done before you reopen. And you'll see why in a second. Uh, ver verify changes is something you do um, after everything is updated and before you let in your users. And, uh, and um, in, the, in the production environment, uh, it's best that this is not a very big test. This is a, probably a very small test, just making sure that, that uh, the, um, the changes that you already tested somewhere else is OK. So as part of your release process, you do a verification step while the system is down. And then you reopen it uh, in the very end. Um, and the reason to do uh, strictly block out your users during steps two, three, and four here is that this will allow you a very basic rollback plan. You can restore the old database um, that you uh, backed up in point two above. You can restore the old version of DHS and, and the code. And then uh, as a quick re verification, you can reopen your system to the users. Um, so um, um, the, the important thing is to have a rollback plan. And these are the two basic uh, plans. Um, it, um, it doesn't need to be much more than this. Um, and uh, except for point three, where you, you would usually have a more details, uh, detailed steps um, that, uh, that is, um, that, that is um, uh, very specific from case to case. And, uh, and this, is, this would be the, the, the main focus of your technical team to make sure you have all the detailed steps for the upgrade that is needed. Um, and Having such a place, uh, um, having so, <laughs> such a rollback plan is extra important when there is um, database changes. Database changes comes with main version upgrades. They come sometimes with point, point releases as well. Um, and um, of course, if you build your own data migration scripts, then this, um, this uh, rollback is uh, extra important. Uh, if you made a mistake in your script, um, this is your script, and it's not tested by anyone else either. So, um, so all the um, all the um, um, it's it's your own responsibility that this script works, and and you should uh, should make sure you have a rollback plan in case something goes wrong, in case your script del deletes all the data values in the database or moves all the data values in the database from one into one stage, and breaks everything. Um, just to re-emphasize, the reason why you want to block your users out while doing the upgrade is that um, in, your in your rollback plan, we are restoring an old version of the database that was um, backed up earlier. And if you restore an old version of the database, and also there was user users adding to the database um, while you were working, then those users will lose their data. So that is why it's important to block the users while you, if you plan for downtime. Uh, if you if you have communicated the downtime uh, upfront, uh, that's usually never a problem to have the system down for a while. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to show you uh, at the end there. I'm going to show you an example process that we followed in another uh, project. Um, the this um, this project was set up with three uh, three servers that we were using in this. Um, the, I will use in this example um, all development. Uh, so after the first uh, time, um, the f the first time we, we developed uh, everything, we did it on the production server. Oops, uh, and um, when we tested on the production server and we 
we uh, released uh, onto the production server. But when the production is running, we are now in maintenance mode. And, and um, when working on, on uh, changes, we would not make them in production. We would work in the development server to the left here. Um, and all program updates, data elements, if you move your uh, data element from one stage to another, that was first done on the development server. Um, and then um, it was tested, it was, uh, it was uh, system tested in that development server. And when we were happy with the changes, we exported the metadata. Um, in this case, uh, it was a simple setup. So we exported all the metadata uh, and uh, imported the, the metadata, except users, and imported this metadata in the test environment to the right here. And then this import was done on a on a on a environment that was um, otherwise uh, the same as production. So it had the same metadata as production, and we could test that the metadata import works. And also in this environment, we could spend some more time testing that our changes were OK. Um, so when there was a metadata update and we came to the day of the release, that was the day we put it into production. And then uh, the detailed um, release to production would be mostly to import the same metadata file that we took into test into production. Um, and, and this is the way, um, uh, th this is sort of a minimum picture of what we recommend when you're working on a, on a, on a tracker implementation that, um, that uh, is uh, already, uh, uh, already uh, running and in maintenance mode. If you're making a change, then you would need some sort of setup like this to be able to develop in a different place um, as you know, when you develop, you will make mistakes and uh, some big mistakes and some small mistakes, and you will test and you will fix and you will make sure that the, the change is okay before you take it to other uh, environments. Um, we had a very similar process for, um, for updating the code of DHS. Uh, we would uh, deploy first uh, into the development environment and test the new WAR file there and look at how it uh, affected the uh, database and test um, existing data that they were fine and, and look at new functionality if it was new functionality there. And then we would deploy that same file to test and when we were ready also to production. So um, I'm nearing the end here and um, a few minutes over, so I'll go very quickly through this. You can read through these recommendations. We have touched on them all in the in the um, earlier in the session. Um, clean uh, your system of all metadata. Keep infrastructure updated and follow point releases. And uh, consider a larger upgrade pro projects from 231 to 33. This is uh, a while ago. Um, you should try to stay above the at least stay on the maintained versions of DHS2, which is 34 and up at the moment. Um, you should keep backups um, routinely. You should make sure there are backups, and you should take backups when you release, as we discussed. Make sure to have the system designed and documented, uh, and also design and document changes you do. Uh, do not develop on the production server. This is a. This is a, if there was one thing I, I I want to teach you today is that you should not develop directly on the production server if you're doing a tracker implementation uh, of any scale. Um, well, of scale bigger than just a handful of users. Um, last point is that you can consider splitting the system into separate instances. We see very different needs for this configuration management in aggregate systems uh, compared to trackers, for example. And especially if there's a tracker that is used by people every day and the tracker being down is a pro practical problem for thousands of people, you should, you should probably have that on a separate instance and you should have a very strict regime for changes or access. And that might not be as needed in an aggregate system. Uh, I'm going to leave you with this checklist to make sure that um, that uh, you, as a manager, make sure this is documents you should have, this is plans you should have, 
um, in, in place. And uh, these will both help you um, uh, avoid the house decaying and, um, and making sure that the house stays um, uh, stays like, I thought the house was coming here. It's not. All right. Uh, that the house stays, uh, stays nice um, and uh, do not rust. Uh, the first point is uh, points you have to make sure um, that is like cross-cutting for all your maintenance. The last point is is kind of points you need for each each change that you want to make to that to the system. Um, so this is your change management points. And with that, I will uh, I will um, hand it back to to Kim. Thanks a lot for attending. Please post your questions. Reach out um, on uh, on Slack and on the community and uh, we'll stay in touch good luck on your uh, good luck on your tracker implementation management